Oliver Twist, by Charles Dickens, adapted by Lisa Malaki, illustrated by Howard McWilliam. Part Two, Chapter Three. Oliver makes a decision. After a month as an apprentice, an event that seems small and petty at the time would end up changing Oliver Twist's future. One day, Oliver and another worker, Noah, had started to eat the evening meal. Noah had been jealous of Oliver's attention from Mr. Sowerberry. Noah started to tease Oliver in his usual ways, but this day. He felt more hateful than ever. How's your mother, Oliver? She's dead," replied Oliver. "Don't see anything more about her." Oliver breathed quickly. His eyes started to tear. "What did she die of?" asked Noah, smirking. "A broken heart. That is what some of the nurses told me." Oliver appears to be talking to himself. I think I know what it may mean to die of that. Tears stream down his face. What are you sniffling about? Asked Noah. Your mother was a bad one, you know. You must know that. What did you say? Asked Oliver. I said she was a bad one, said Noah. Good thing she died when she did, or she would have probably been hung. Crimson with fury, Oliver overturned the table and some chairs. He grabbed Noah by the throat and shook him. With a heavy blow to the head, he knocked Noah to the ground. Just a minute before, Oliver had looked like a quiet, meek, dejected creature, but his spirit was roused at last. His blood was on fire. He's going to murder me! Screams Noah. Oliver's gone mad! Someone help me! Charlotte and Mrs. Sowerberry rushed into the room. You little wretch! Screams Charlotte as she grabs Oliver's arm. You ungrateful, murderous boy! Noah was able to regain his footing. And with the help of Mrs. Sowerberry, they subdued Oliver. They dragged a kicking, screaming Oliver into a closet and locked him inside. Mrs. Sowerberry fell into a chair. We would have all been murdered. He's mad. I hope this teaches my husband not to bring any of that kind into our house again. She caught Noah over to her. He'll get down that door in ten minutes' time. Run and get Mr. Bumble. He'll know how to handle that beast. She gave him a shove. Don't bother to get your hat. Be off with you and get us out at once. Noah took off without his hat, tearing through the streets until he reached the workhouse gate. When Mr. Bumble saw him, he knew something was terribly wrong. Has Oliver run away? He asked. No, sir, no. But he has turned vicious. He tries to murder me," said Noah. "He tries to murder Charlotte and the missus too." Noah continues to exaggerate the extent of what had happened. He would have killed the master too, but he's out and about town. Missus Sowerberry needs you to come at once. When they arrived back at the undertaker's home, Oliver was still screaming and kicking at the door. Bumble watched towards the door and gave it a swift kick himself. Oliver, do you know who this is? Yes, replied Oliver. Are you afraid of my voice? Are you trembling? Asked Bumble. No, shouted Oliver. Bumble took a step back and straightened himself up. It was an answer he had not expected. By the look of the three others in the room, they.
They were just as surprised. He must be mad," said Mrs. Sowerberry. "No boy in his right mind would speak to you that way." "It's not madness," said Bumble. "It's meat." He scowled at her. "You've overfed him. You raise a spirit in him. I'm afraid if you cut him on gruel, this would never have happened." Mrs. Sowerberry felt ashamed. I only fed him what no one else would eat. Even the dog wouldn't eat what Oliver ate. It was at this moment that Mr. Sowerberry returned. Upon hearing the news that Oliver tries to murder everyone, he knew what he must do. He opened the door and put Oliver out of the cellar. Now. You're a nice fellow, aren't you? Why did you go about threatening everyone? Oliver pointed to Noah. His face was still full of rage. He calls my mother names. So what? Said Mrs. Sowerberry. She deserved what she was called. That is a lie! Screamed Oliver. Mrs. Sowerberry burst into tears. Mr. Sowerberry knew that if he didn't punish Oliver this instant or hesitate in any way, there would be a price to pay with his wife. He at once gave Oliver a beating that satisfied all. Oliver was then sent to his trap room. He sat silently for a long time. Finally, he rose to his feet and opened the door. He stood looking out. At the vastness of the cold world, he looked up at the stars, which seemed so far away. He closed the door softly. He then gathered up the few belongings he had, tied them up in a handkerchief, and sat down on the bench to wait for the morning light to appear. Early the next morning, Oliver Twist ran away. He had to back the way he came. He paused at the workhouse when he saw his old friend Dick outside. Oliver! cried Dick. Hush, Dick! No one can know I've stopped by. You mustn't tell anyone. I've been treated poorly, and I'm running away to seek my fortune. He touched his friend's cheek. You look so pale, Dick. I'll be all right, Oliver. I won't tell her so I saw you. You must go now. Be safe. He kissed Oliver on the cheek. God bless you, Oliver. The blessing was from a young child's lips, but it was the first that Oliver had ever heard said upon him. During all the struggles and troubles that came from that day forward, he never once forgot the blessings of young Dick. Chapter Four: Figgin and His Gang. Oliver was on his way to London. He had often heard the workhouse man say that London was where the poor could find ways to live. It was the perfect place for a homeless boy. It took Oliver six days to land in London. He travelled with a few shirts, some crumbs of bread, and two pairs of socks in his bundle. He begged for water at cottage doors, and slept in meadows and haystacks. He felt cold, tired, and alone. On his journey, signs started to appear that beggars would be put in jail. This frightened Oliver a great deal, and made him walk faster. But luck was with him when a man gave him a meal of bread and cheese. A woman greeted him with pity and sympathy, and offered him what little she had. She had a son who was off wandering about in some part of the world. She hoped someone would treat him as well as she treated Oliver. On the seventh morning, Oliver made his way to the tiny town of Barnet. It was there that he met the strangest looking boy. He was about his own age, but. Had the manners and air of a man. He wore a man's coat, 
that reached to his heels. His trousers hung off of him. Hello, said the boy to Oliver. How are you? Tired, said Oliver. I've walked a long way. Been walking for seven days straight. Seven days, said the boy. You must be hungry then. If you want grub, you shall have grub. He led Oliver to a nearby shop where they feasted on ham and bread. Staying in London? Asked the strange boy. Yes. Got any lodgings? No. Money? No. The strange boy whistled and put his arms into his pockets as far as the big coat sleeve would let them go. Do you live in London? Asked Oliver. I do indeed. When I'm home, that is. I suppose you like a place to sleep tonight. Please, answered Oliver. I know a man in London. He will give you free room and board if you're with me. Oliver couldn't resist the offer of a free room. After that, he learned the boy's name was Jack Dawkins. My friends refer to me as the Apple Dodger. It wasn't until eleven o'clock that evening that Oliver and Jack made their way to the man's house. As they approached the town, a stench invaded the air. It was a dirty and wretched place. By far, it was the worst that Oliver ever laid eyes on. For a split second, Oliver thought of running away. But in seconds, he was being put inside the house. Who's there? Said a faraway voice. Put me in a slam, replies Jack. This seems to be a secret password. It must have been the correct password because a man's face peeped out of a passage. There's two of you. Who's that? A new pal, replies Jack. Pulling Oliver forward, is Fagin upstairs? He didn't wait for an answer. Jack pulled Oliver up the dark stairway that had several broken steps. The ease of which Jack travelled up the rickety stairs left Oliver to believe that Jack had walked on them often enough. Once upstairs, Jack threw open the door to a back room. The walls and ceiling were black with age and dirt. There was a meal upon the fire and a table in front of it. Candles were on the table. Sausages cooked in the frying pan as a man stood with fork in hand above them. This is him, Fagin," said Jack. "My friend Oliver Twist." The man grinned. He took Oliver by the hands and called for everyone to gather around him. Five boys scurried over. One was anxious to hang Oliver's cap on a peg for him. Another offered to put his hands in Oliver's pockets so he wouldn't have the trouble of emptying them himself. We are very glad to have you, Oliver," said Fagin. "Dodger, take off the sausages and fix Oliver a plate." Oliver's mouth watered when he saw his plate filled high with sausages. As he ate, he couldn't help but notice all the handkerchiefs hanging about the place. Don't you be thinking about those right now," said Fagin as he handed Oliver a drink. Oliver took a sip, and soon felt tired. It wasn't long before he fell into a deep sleep. Fagin and the boys tricked Oliver into thinking that they earned money by cleaning handkerchiefs. Aren't making pocket books. Maybe you can teach me to make such beautiful things," said Oliver. All of them roared with laughter. This puzzled Oliver. The odd game they played puzzled him too. Figgin would dress up and pretend to shop around the room. Then the boys would try to reach into his pockets without him seeing or feeling them. They even convinced Oliver to play this silly game. It wasn't until a week later 
that Oliver understood that it was not a silly game at all. They were practicing their pickpocket skills. All the handkerchiefs and trinkets in Fagin's room were stolen. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part two. To be continued in part three. If you like this story, please like, share, and subscribe. See you then.